All right, Harry, I really appreciate you joining me today. How have you been? Very well, thanks. I'm delighted to be chatting to you. <laughs> Great. Um, one thing I wanted to ask before we really dive into the, you know, the, the score for Roadkill and a few of your other works, I saw that you went to Oxford. What college did you go to? Uh, gosh, uh, I went to Somerville College, Oxford, um, which was a uh, used to be it was one of the first. Uh, in fact, I think it might even have been the first, um, but I'm not sure. But tertiary education for women was not a thing oh. um, in the late 1800s. So it was the women's college, basically, it was one of the first women's college in any university in the world. And I, when I went there, they had just made the decision to let some boys in. So <laughs> I think that I'm not sure if there are any still that are exclusively women colleges anymore but I think there might be one still anyway but yes I went to Somerville I had a good good time there well yeah and, and the reason I ask is my my wife's from England and she went to Teddy Hall um, she graduated oh, from right, there okay. a couple of years ago so she I told her that you were from Oxford uh, and she wanted yeah. to know well there you go yeah, another form of women's college as well yeah good okay. <laughs> um all right so so as of our recording, uh, Roadkill, new BBC One series, and in the US, it's going to be on PBC uh, Masterpiece Theatre, um, just started releasing. And, you know, it, it seems like a really timely show. The main character, uh, Hugh Laurie, plays Peter Lawrence, this kind of rising conservative MP. Um, and to me, it seems like given the climate, that that would be a very... I don't know, that, that he'd be someone you'd want to root against, but listening to your score, it never sounds like that. Um, what was kind of, what was your decision-making process in kind of creating the sound for him in the in the show? Well, I think what's what's interesting about the score and the show is, that, and they sort of they are inextricably linked. Is when I first chatted to Michael Keller, the director uh, of the show, he he made it very clear that he didn't want the score to sort of, I suppose like most scores that I've done and most people are asked to do nowadays, sort of uh, follow the minutiae uh, of the drama and the narrative. So there's lots of sort of quite dark and sort of strange things happen throughout the course of Roadkill. But essentially uh, the main character, our central figure, the politician um, played by Hugh Laurie is not Peter Lawrence. He's, he's not, He's a sociopath, really. He's not interested in any of that. He doesn't care about the roadkill. He doesn't care about the consequences of his, his, his actions at all. Um, he's sort of a very suave, sophisticated, shiny character that's kind of irritatingly likable, despite what he ends up doing um, and his actions. So I think that, and everything is really from his point of view. So I think that was what the focus of, they wanted the focus of the show to be and the focus of the music to be was sort of backing that up. So the music is actually quite sort of, um, elegant and pretty and tuneful and melodic and it isn't really very often occasionally it's you sort of have to do the nuts and bolts and the tom and jerry of like there's a super dark bit and it occasionally gets a bit darker but a lot of the time it's just sort of it's 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 sort of gliding over the top of all of the nonsense that's going on underneath and i think that because that's kind of what his character does all the way through uh, which is is i think what's really interesting about the drama i know everyone else has got drawn into the politics of it and, you know, but i think that in terms of for me as a musician dealing with emotions humans characters sort of studies i think that's what i find really fascinating about that and that doesn't really matter if you're in the states and you don't really understand the sort of particular sort of uh sort of machinations of you know the conservatives versus labor or whether it's democrat or republican it's more just a particular figure in a position of power and how those kind of character traits character traits that might by a psychiatrist be deemed to be a disorder or a syndrome or something that might make you sick can actually make you very successful Bit like the psychopath test i don't know if you read that but it's the same kind of no. idea really but it was quite interesting i think um so that was why yes that's why the music and i was a joy to do as a composer because a lot of the time nowadays especially there's a lot of the work i do which is more um sort of art house uh sort of uh social realist dramas and film scores for things like that the job of the composer it seems to be to be quite sophisticated uh, as a scorer you're if you're not noticed that's generally quite a good thing i mean obviously if you're doing batman or star wars you obviously that's a completely different thing but for a lot of the stuff i do uh you know you don't really want anyone to notice that you've done anything you just want them to feel a bit uneasy or a bit sad or you know whereas this is completely the different thing it's like it d deliberately has its own character and it's deliberately quite a caricature almost um, in its own way and it's very stylized so it's quite fun to do basically <laughs> well that 
<clears throat> that's one thing that I really noticed, um, you know, because I, I had a general idea of the plot before listening to your score, and I listened to it a few times, and I was not expecting this, kind of, like, jazzy, you know, piano and bass heavy score that, I mean, it, it's, it's playful, it's stylish, it, it does have kind of dangerous aspects that come up, and especially once the, the drumming gets a little more heavy and chaotic, um, but then that, that still goes away, and, and that, you know, it's easy to describe, the suave nature comes back, and, and I thought that was really interesting, because, you know, you're right, you're really just honing in on uh, Hugh Laurie's character, and I don't know, I, I have to say, I, I didn't expect it, but, I mean, it, it was, you know, really fun to listen to because of that. Not to say that, you know, being a sociopath is fun. <laughs> no, I'm sure not. But I think it's interesting that there are, there are there, as you say, there are moments where, I mean, he's a really, he is a suave, sophisticated character. He really is. And he sort of glides around the place. But the moments where those drums begin to take over, it begins to get a bit darker or more wobbly or throbby or the stuff, the other yeah. stuff that you might know I've done. I guess, oh, that's kind of, yeah, more what you would expect. That's when that's when the world begins to his 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 sort of he begins to be seriously threatened and even he's a bit like mm, hang on maybe this isn't going so well <laughs> it might it might actually be my downfall and then every and every at every time oh no it's all okay fine i'll just glide over it all again um so that, it, that that's kind of that it was a, there was a there are a few points where we sort of made the conscious decision to say no this is now this is really high stakes this is it's potentially going to totally turn him over and even he realizes because he although he's a sociopath he doesn't really care about he's not he doesn't have empathy for other people he he does at certain points care that the rest of the world out to get him might actually bring him down and stop him progressing which is what he can is concerned about so those points where he thinks these things might stop him from moving forward or it might catch up with him then it's it gets a bit more concerned but then the act is back and he's just gliding over like a swan. But he is kind of, he's kind of cool. He's annoyingly likable. I, well, actually, I don't think anyone's really likable in the drama. They're all quite unlikable. But he is, he's the most likable in a way of all of them, really. And so because of that, I think the, the path that you chose, you know, ends up working really well. Was that the, you know, to, to kind of create that likable, suave um, attribute of him? Was that the first thing you jumped to, or did you try a few different sounds before finding one that really worked? Well, we, we tried quite a few different things. We tried taking ourselves a bit too seriously and saying this is a really political thing and it's an important thing. And then we, and then we thought, no, it isn't really, it's not really, it's kind of, and then, so we tried quite a few different things. And actually, it's interesting, the response um, so far in the UK, it's, it's been out, this is the second week now, it's going to be aired now. Um, so the response in the UK has been interesting that a lot of people have, uh, commented on the score and a lot of people have mentioned that it's um it's very different and it's very refreshing but it, it's not it's it for me it, it's it's actually a throwback to the scores of the 70s or so it's not like new music i'm not it's just it's just not what we're normally asked to do now so some people are really like well this just gets in the way and they're really annoyed about it and other people are like oh it's amazing it's so different it's like well it's not it's kind of neither it's just it's a it's just sort of more like a throwback to the scoring of the 70s which is just fun to do and if you listen to the scores and what we really listen to a lot and and i, I and i pay a massive sort of um debt of uh creativity to the scores of david shire mm -hmm. he's a fantastic composer who did the conversation a couple of film uh the uh, uh the of all the president's men those scores listen to those scores there's a lot of similarities in the sounds and textures i mean of course they're bigger and they're big movies and stuff but right. that that is you know it, it's more a throwback to those uh the scores of those so sort of let me tell you a story you know that's it's it's sort of a, there's a lot of that in it and it's very on, on its sleeve in terms of musical storytelling um it's very clear in that way and also it was just it's just you know it, in a very basic level if you're just like a, a music student or thinking about how can you how can you musically detail a, a sort of a Machiavellian composer who's a bit snaky? And straight away you're in, I don't know if you, I'm obviously on the phone here, but I straight away, of course you can go into, you're going to go into chromaticisms, aren't you? And that's basically what the score does, all these kind of weird. And also those, those kind of, unu those, those non-related sort of chord changes. So you go from all the way through those C major to, they're kind of slightly odd, slightly odd, and then shifting back, and it doesn't really progress in normal functional harmony like most of the music of the last three or four hundred years has kind of developed in that way. And so, but this kind of it's more it's more shifty around like impressionist music, like Debussy, or so. It's not new. It's just it was just a fun thing to tap into, I think, and that's what 
it was quite fun and, and happily the um the director was into it as well so he turned up to all of the sessions which i'd never had before mm. and um and was really involved and and he sort of really believed in it, i think and was very encouraging so yes we did so it's a very long-winded answer but we did spend a lot of time thinking about the tone and then once we got it we then thought it would be good to have a single instrument all the way through because he's a very singular man and, and that was great and then as we then developed we realized that actually there, there are a couple of scenes with the montage sequences and then things where it gets a bit darker and we're like, actually we do need a few more things so we thought well let's stick with the piano because it's kind of classy it seems mm-hmm. to suit well, his character really really well um, and we loved that chromaticism but then we added sort of classic sort of a uh, cabaret band i suppose isn't it sort of double bass drums vibes cl- doubling with the clarinets sort of not quite sort of um Claire's Marie or jazzy clown it's a bit sort of it's like a classical musician playing it once again trying to keep it quite sort of sophisticated and suave but it has those those elements and then you know the uh the band sort of once we've got that sort of palette of sounds together we've so that's we're just going to stick with that there's no electronics uh or very very limited if we do um and then I don't think we used any synths or anything there's a little bit there's a little bit actually but it's all generated from those instruments so it was mm. we were quite sort of quite disciplined about that I mean, it, it, you know, I, as I said before, I, I think it, it does make a lot of sense. It's really fitting to the, the character and the style. Um, I don't know if I'm reading too much into kind of that main motif, you know, where you're, you're describing it as a little irregular and unorthodox in the way that you kind of put it together. Uh, you know, I, I guess you could see that that's kind of a reflection of the character as well. You know, he's this sort of, uh, I mean, irregular person in some ways. Yeah, I mean, he, abs- he absolutely is. He's a sort of, he's unusual in that. I don't, and that's where this might not translate in the, in the US, or it might do, but he's basically, he, in, in terms of part, I mean, I don't really want to get drawn on the party politics, because right. it's not, we're, we're, none of us are particularly interested, but he is a kind of misfit in, in his own party. So he is in, in this, this sort of, the, the conservative party, which is supposed to be the, the sort of right of center party in the UK. Um, but a lot of those guys, we have a sort of odd school system over here where a lot, there's sort of quite a lot of people go to private sort of fee paying schools and, uh, and, 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 and generally most people who represent uh, the, the sort of representatives of the Conservative Party, uh, 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 ministers in the Conservative Party, they're traditionally, I mean, it's a stereotype, but they're stereotypically traditionally sort of from that sort of educational, those education establishments. And he is not from one of those. He's a sort of a, a publicly educated um, individual. And that straight away sort of sets him apart from all of his colleagues in his party. So he is a sort of a bit of an outsider. He's quite a maverick. He doesn't think like a lot of the rest of them do. Um, and so, you know, the, he's, he's quite mischievous as well in that respect. And he has sort of mm-hmm. that, you know, and I think that all of those things serve to sort of, I mean, when you're writing any kind of music about, when you're trying to tell a story, you think you're trying to, I mean, I, I mean everyone does. You spend quite a bit of time thinking about the story. And then you mess around for quite a few days, really, just thinking about uh, the story, trying to work out what might work, trying loads of different things out. Um, and then, so all of these things, I don't think, you know, I think if you do, I don't think you, I don't think you can almost read too much into these things. I think if you can think of it, probably a composer who's, you know, they've probably spent a bit of time thinking about that as well. I mean, you spend a lot of time thinking about these things. So it has, and hopefully at some stage, at some level, it all sort of subconsciously sort of filters in there somehow. That's the hope anyway. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. And going going back a little bit when you're talking about how some of the reaction has been people really liking the score and kind of liking how it, it I mean, it does sound new to people. You know, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, some of David Shire's music. I actually was listening to the conversation, I don't know, Thank two you. days ago because you have, you know, in that film, you also have kind of that overriding piano theme. Um, yeah. So obviously, you know, there there's kind of the similarity with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the, the reaction that I've seen as well. And I had um, some people online, you know, telling me to, to make sure that, that you knew that, that they, that they liked the score. So I had to, uh, that's nice. to, to make sure you knew. Well, I, it's been really nice. I had to, I mean, that, the whole process has been really nice. I don't, cause it were well, nice. It's just a silly word, but it's been lovely. The whole process, because I, I think, you know, that, but as I say, most of the time, a lot of, uh, composers work it goes unnoticed and that's fine mm-hmm. i can't get a weird sort of perverse kick out of that so stealth scoring and you know you go and, i'll go and see a film if it's on my local cinema and just quietly sit at the back and then hear people as they come out and see if they kind of go scared or sad or whatever you, you know and i quite I like that you know that's kind of cool 
but if it's quite nice, it is nice, you know, <laughs> it's been a nice, right. it's my it is quite nice when someone, so, you know, when someone actually notices that what you've done, say, I really liked it, you know, because at this point, I suppose it is, it's an obvious melody, it's an obvious cut, two or three themes that come and it's an obvious sort of thing. So that aspect of it has been really lovely. And I've had so, so many sort of people get in touch saying they really enjoyed it, which is great. Um, but also the process of doing it during, in fact, my sister has just come back from the States. She lived in mm. North Carolina for a few years and she literally just came back a couple of weeks ago and she said she hadn't realised that over here the lockdown was quite, she said obviously everyone's been locked down in different ways, but we had a very specific period where we were properly locked down in the UK. And I think this score was done in that period. And so I wrote it here at home, obviously, but then towards the end of that period, we were trying to work out how we were gonna record it. And so there were a couple of interesting things about that. It, firstly, no, it was the first session in London that was recorded post lockdown. It wasn't really post lockdown. We had to get in touch with the musicians union, all the musicians, we had to get specialist cleaners in, see if we could do it, sign loads of extra forms with loads of lawyers. It was an absolute nightmare to make it work. And I was like, you just can't do this stuff remotely. We have to get these guys in a room together. And so we went into um, Air Studios and recorded, which is a fantastic studio, and recorded. Yeah. And the other fantastic thing is, you called whoever you wanted and they were all free because they <laughs> everything had been cancelled. So, so what, was, what was lovely about that was seeing the musicians as they kind of came into the studio one by one, we recorded individually and then you know, had separation between bass and drums. And anyway, we did very, as, as much as we could. We did it sort of as sensibly as we could and responsibly as we could. But it was just great seeing their faces come in after basically, I think it was sort of towards the end of the, I, mean, I was going to say three months, it's basically 10 weeks where we really didn't leave our houses and you just went to the shop and that was it and everyone was masked up and just to get supplies and that was it and no one was going into work. It was really quite extreme. And I mean, I've, I know this is not an unusual thing, but it's just in this particular context right. of this, this school, well, for all of our lives, it is an unusual thing. Isn't it? It's not something that we've ever experienced any other year. And so it was just lovely to see their faces coming in through the doors uh, and just, you know, the hope, you know, that maybe we're out of this is this kind of you know because i suppose recorded music is one of the things that we can now do a bit um in a sort of socially physically distanced manner we can do a bit of that uh i mean we're beginning to do kind of a bit more live stuff but it's still pretty not great really um so i think that the musicians coming in sort of and their, their realization that you know maybe there is a source of income a little bit and we might start being able to do this and then sure enough you know the next few weeks as we were in and out of their studios mixing the sort of orchestra started coming in and you know it all, you know fits you know separated out all this you know desks of strings quite a lot further out than they would normally be but it all started happening again and you guys from the states came over netflix came back over and started started recording everything again it's cool you know so it sort of started up again but it was lovely to see the beginning of that process so that was also a really enjoyable part of the process so i think it's been and it was just lucky and i felt so lucky to be a musician and busy during that period as well because so many of my friends were just, you know, they're just, their entire diaries were cancelled for the next year, you know. Um, so I just, I think in many ways, I think this job was a massive blessing for me, really. Well, I, I imagine for a lot of the, the musicians that came in too, obviously they're going to be happy that it's it's worked for them after having you know none for however long, but also that it, you know, I imagine it's something fun to play because it's fun to listen to. You know, it's not, they're not recording mostly underscore incidental music. It's, it's yeah. you know, strong melodies throughout. I know. I really, I always worry about that with, with, because obviously a lot of the time you do have to write, we, they call them footballs. And so, you know, when they've got, you know, this, when they've got, so for anyone, just, when you've got semi briefs or whole notes in America, you call them, but you know, mm -hmm. the big four beat notes. Yep. And then obviously a lot of score is basically that just nice, nice straightforward string chords, uh, you know, split across the four parts and, the double bass, the octave below, and they're just playing slow, but it, and, it, and it, with a few swells and hairpins, you know, crescendos and diminuendos here and there. And it, it's irritating because it does really work. It's unbelievably boring for those guys to play. And you get like, there's some of the best musicians in the world and there's Air or Abbey Road, these studios, you know, it's phenomenal musicians and they're sitting there just playing the most dull kind of like, you know, third, fourth grade music, <laughs> just like, but that's, that is basically what most, the lot of the job, a lot of the time is that, and that's kind of just, cause that's, it's, a, it's functional music. That's what works. You know, you need tones and you need that, you know, just sort of just gently set, set a scene. Whereas exactly as you say, this was a different thing for them. There was some fun stuff they could really get their teeth into it. And I did, we were lucky, like I say, we got, you know, we got the kit down to a phenomenal, phenomenal jazz pianist um, who came in and was able to do his stuff on it. And then Martin France, again, a, a just ludicrous um, drummer, jazz drummer, who was amazing. And for the, some of those drum sequences, you know, I won't give anything away, but the end of episode two, it's quite a remarkable thing happens. And he just he just went for it and watched the picture and just, just did his thing. And 
it's just joy to be able to work with those guys. Same thing with Ollie Pashley. The, the, he's, a, he's a phenomenal clarinetist, that guy. So I just, it was really lovely to be able to give them something. And then just also, you know, there were themes, but then also there were moments where they could just run with it and go and do some crazy stuff. And actually, we're going to release the score as a sort of soundtrack, you know. And uh, mm. it, uh, so I think it has to be released in the States first. So by the time people have listened to this, you might better listen to it on Spotify and Apple Music and all that. Um, so the... Um, but there's when you listen to that, there, there's some there's some pretty crazy stuff in there, which is kind of fun, like some properly like avant-garde, crazy clarinet messing around and, and some crazy drumming. And so it's been quite it was really fun to do that. So all right, so I actually think that's really interesting because so much of the time in in my experiences, you know, whatever is scored, it's just it's written for the film and, and that's it. Um, but you know, having kind of that jazz aspect and the fact that at least in the States, and I you know, I I think at the UK as well, you don't really hear that, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't hear that style as much in film music. So having, you know, like a drummer playing fills and and basically soloing and, and the same with the clarinetist and the and the pianist, I mean, you know, I, I imagine they're doing that while watching whatever they're, um, uh, you know, whatever's being filmed, you know, the, the tracking. But how was how was that for you kind of turning those more spontaneous moments into an actual functional score well that is that's a really good question and it's I, i've i've struggled with this not i haven't struggled with it but i'm i, I have an interesting i think every composer has an interesting for for, for, for film and tv sort of scoring has, has an interesting sort of battle with this because i think you know your job as a composer is to write music and be sort of quite uh, prescriptive about it and then you notate it and then give it to musicians that's the traditional sort of concepts of what a composer is. Because increasingly there are now composers that don't do that. I'm sort of quite old fashioned. I was trained in that way. So that's what I do. So I've got manuscripts out and I write it all out. And then increasingly you've got uh, composers that don't do that at all. And a lot of musicians, so some of the best musicians I know, you wouldn't even know if something was D minor or whatever it is, you know, to play, they just know and it feels right. And that's, that's how they navigate their way through uh, the musical journeys that they kind of explore. But I think I have discovered having one of the luxuries of sort of film scoring and uh, scoring things for TV is that you get to sort of delve your toes uh, irreverently in sort of other worlds. Uh, so people, you know, from whether that be sort of, uh, sort of the jazz world or the classical world or culturally completely different. You know, I did a documentary for uh, about a tragedy uh, from some Chinese um, immigrants in the UK. Um, eight years ago and I remember we got loads of Chinese musicians in and obviously I had no idea about any of that stuff or last year I did some stuff uh, with a load of African musicians from Sen Senegalese musicians who are fantastic and so you you sort of you then become a sort of producer and how prescriptive can you be in those search, search circumstances and in, initially when I started out uh, sort of 20, 20 odd years ago I was very prescriptive I was like well, this is exactly what you've got to do and I notated it and then got a translator to sort of translate these things to various different people and uh, and and invariably I was, uh, the, the, the results were not so good. So I think the job, then I've, I've slowly, gradually realized that you need to be prescriptive up to a point and then you need to be aware of the individual's skills and their, their idiosyncratic way of playing or the fact that they might be from a completely different musical culture. And then you need to be aware of that and then allow them to do their thing, but within a framework that is then going to hopefully be useful to you and have enough takes. So you're exactly right. So in, for instance, this is a bit more straightforward. It's not sort of cultural appropriation or anything like that. It's right. just literally these guys are from a different musical culture, yeah, it's a, you know, jazz background. I'm not really from that background, but I know I can sort of hear in my mind, you know, I can hear that I can sort of tap into that and you know that this scene we want. And I, for someone like Martin, for the drummer, I was a specific, I was, I was just, I wasn't much more specific rather we had, we had the picture, I showed him the scene a couple of times and I literally stood next to him while he was by the drums. And I'm, not, I'm a string player, I'm a pianist and a cellist or cellist and, a, and I play with the piano. And he, um, and I was sort of standing next to him going, yeah, and, then, and I was like, just making loads of crazy noise. Yeah, 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 well, like this, like this, yeah, 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 okay, cool, cool, cool. And then we did four or five, and that was it. And then it was just like, great. And then we sort of edited it a little bit, but roughly speaking, because the, the luxury was the director was there. So we were able to, uh, you know, if I thought it was going to be too, if he thought it was going to be too much, and it's just going to be to see the cutting room floor once they got to the mix stage, the dub, you know, they, then um, I knew that wasn't going to happen because he was there. So once he'd said, yeah, that's okay, he often would say, in fact, specifically with the drumming stuff, there often reason, the reason we don't see that much of that kind of scoring is basically because it does interfere with the diegetic noise and the dialogue because right. it's really quite sort of. So for those moments, 
you know, we, I'd have a chat with the director before, so this is what I'm thinking. It means it's going to be a bold manoeuvre and it's only going to work if you turn it up. And that is basically the main principle bit of the sound at that point. Um, because they have a, they have to make a choice at the mix stage. And there's basically three big levers that you can pull. I mean, I was chatting to a dubbing mixer about this last year and he said, the thing is, you can't have the music dialogue and all the effects, which are the three big things you've got to push and pull people's emotions and stories and whatever you want to do at any point. You can't have them all full on all the time. You, one basically at some point has to take prominence and then the other one has to come up and then sometimes you can have a couple playing with each other. And, and of course, as a composer and as an effects uh, sort of uh, sound effects and sound designer, you think about those things a lot while you're doing it. But you know, when, you, when you're dealing with drums and a drum solo and fills, there's not a lot of room, there's not a lot of bandwidth, frequency bandwidth for anything else, do you know what I mean? So it is, that's I suppose why it's slightly rarer. It sort of gets in the way. Um, but it, it's very fun that we were able to do it on this one. But you see it, going back to the 70s films, you know, you see it in you know, Gene Hackman, what's that, the French Connection. You think about all mm. that, it's like brazen bright noise all the time, and there's a crazy drumming and Taxi Driver, obviously that very famous, like cleaning the cab. But you know, there, there are, there are, but it's it's quite old school. It's quite fun. <laughs> well, and, and you're you're totally right because especially with the drums, you know, you can you can push the levels down, and then it's almost like you know, unless you want something that's kind of like a, a subconscious rhythm playing in the background, it's yes, yeah, it's, it's what's the point? You know, if you're if yeah. you're having these just crazy drumming segments, they've they've got to be in the forefront and just yeah. you're know, almost battering the viewer because yeah. Exactly. It loses all the effectiveness otherwise. Exactly, exactly that. So it's like, you know, once again, a lovely thing to be able to be allowed to do that sort of thing, you know. Um, it was really, it was good fun. And to sort of pretend to be a bit of a jazzer <laughs> for a few months. <laughs> well, you know, it's the, after, after the score and the show, you know, you're going to have a little, at least a little bit of jazz street cred. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, um, but that kind of leads me to something else. You know, because you you did a little, you did some jazz adjacent work in Shame, and obviously there was a lot of, um, you know, older jazz recordings in that uh, film as well. And, you know, and I think what, like, Welcome to the Punch had a more kind of electronic feel, and I think yeah. it was your, your score for the show Wild Bill had a more, like, acoustic, westerny feel as well. So you've hit yeah. a lot of, you've hit a ton of different genres over the years. Um, so obviously just kind of leading more into jazz has to be kind of a nice change of pace for you. Yeah, it was, uh, it was actually, it was a, re it was a really lovely thing to do. And I loved the, the fact that that allowed me to get, I love the fact that it allowed me to, um, use instrumentalists who were a bit more fluid and a bit more able to sort of think on their feet. And that's not, that's not a negative thing about sort of, um, it's not a negative thing about classical musicians, classic trained musicians. I mean, I'm a classic trained musician myself, but in this particular case, it was nice to be able to come up with themes and variations and then have those as sketches. And then just, we'd record what I'd written and what I'd envisaged. And then we'd do sort of three or four wild takes. And invariably, something out of the wild takes was like, yeah, that's really much better than what I would have done. Great, thanks. <laughs> you know, and that's, and that's a lovely, a lovely, you know, so, so I've got hopefully what I feel it was a very symbiotic relationship. Um, and it'll say for you a respectful relationship. I mean, I've got such a huge amount of respect for instrumentalists and musicians. And in fact, it's to the extent where I think that's, that's one of the reasons I work as hard as I do on the scores when I work on them is because I'm, I'm desperate to sort of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, not, not let the musicians down when they come through the studio doors. <laughs> like, oh, what's he done this time? It's terrible. You know, it's just like, I want them to think, oh, this is quite a good thing. You know, so that does sort of get, gets, gets me going. So I, I'm, yeah, I suppose, but you're right. I mean, there's a lot, there's, you know, you t I think that's one of the, the lovely things of doing film music is you get, you really tap into the characters and the worlds of these people. I mean, Wild Bill, exactly. That's Rob Lowe's character. It was kind of a bit Wild Westy and kind of folky yeah. and kind of completely different and jangly and quite fun. And, but there was a bit of English in that one. There's, there's a bit, bit there's a load of um, low woodwind, like bassoons, contra bassoons, bassoons, bass clarinets as well. It's kind of weird sort of mashup of things, but that was quite folky. And, uh, I'm quite, I'm quite into a bit of folky stuff, actually. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, I've, been quite, I've, just, I've just finished a film where we've done a little bit, a bit of folky stuff in that as well, and that was quite, it was quite fun. But yeah, it's nice to tap into all these different worlds. I think a lot often I get asked by um, sort of composers who are studying film composition about that, and that, does that, do you not worry that you then don't have a sound of your own sound? And I think 
I d I've never really thought about that. I, I, I am told by um, lots of people who I sort of respect that, you know, there does seem to be a sort of distinctive thing that I do and there is a thread through a lot of my work. Um, but I think it's, you know, my, the only thing I'd say to people who ask those questions is, is as long as you, it's all about storytelling, musical storytelling, and, and you, as long as you're true to yourself, it's so naff, but if you're true to yourself and you love what you're doing, you're really trying to do the best thing you possibly can and you're, you like what you're doing, then naturally your sort of taste selection, your all of your musical experiences refracted through your sort of prism of what you're able to do and your um, your sort of taste will come out in some way, shape, or form, whether you're doing something that's a bit jazzy or something that's a bit wild westy or whether it's a bit folky or whatever, you know what I mean? It'll it'll mm -hmm. that's that's just that's kind of almost like a it's just a it's a slightly different way of colouring it in, but essentially the DNA underneath it is probably still going to be you in some way, shape, or form. Um, it's because it's not I don't it's not sort of it's not pastiche composition in that sense. You're just you're just you're just tapping into a, uh, a sound world, but then doing your own thing within that. That's, that's the way I sort of think about it. Yeah. I don't know that makes sense, but I think you know, for a lot of fans or you know, younger composers coming up, they've kind of been used to people like Hans Zimmer and John Williams who have these, you know, they, they don't necessarily always do the same style, but it, their their work is can be very distinct. Or you, know, you have composers like, Philip Glass or you know, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross now that they have their sound and and you hear five seconds of it and you know okay that's them yeah. um, but for you know I'd say for the vast vast majority of composers you have to almost be a chameleon to be able to jump between all these different genres and so yeah you're totally right there as you do it you have your your distinct aspects, or maybe you you like variations on a particular motif that you know, finds its way throughout scores, but it's you know having having a a sound that's yours and yours alone is I I, I think it's a remnant of people listening to a, a handful of these you know uber famous composers and thinking yeah. everything's like that. I think that's right. And I think, but also the, what's interesting about that is you care for what you wish for. Cause those, I know those guys, you know, have, you know, it's, it's sometimes troubling for, you know, if you're Philip Glass, obviously a phenomenal composer, but he's mm. you, you probably, you know, quite want to do something a bit different, but then they just want the same thing that he did 30, 40 right. years ago. Do you know what I mean? So I, and I, I totally, I can imagine that in some ways that'd be a difficult thing to sort of, uh, Trying to navigate your way out of really in some ways. I'm not that I do, I'm not saying that he should do what he wants to, but it's just I can imagine. I, I, well, I, what, no, what I am saying is I know that some of those composers, I know some of those composers, and I know some of them feel very constrained by the success mm -hmm. of their previous work. And by the time everyone knows about it and everyone wants it, it's something they did 20, 30 years ago, and they're still being asked to do the same thing. So I think that's it's in some ways a bit of a poison chalice, I think, as well, but you know. Well, depends, I, I think the, 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 the caveat to that is, though, I think if you, it depends what the, you know, you interestingly, Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross, who's also amazing stuff they do, it's probably slightly easier to feel like you're being more diverse all the time because they're basically just like crazy synth sonic explorers <laughs> effects and it's like just let's go, it's cool. So I think that that will always feel fresh for those guys. So I think they, maybe they maybe they're the best. Maybe they got the best best <laughs> option. <laughs> what's what's actually really funny, um, you know, not to go on too much of a tangent about them is. As of as of recording date, I think two or three days ago, you know, Trent Reznor released this secret website um, where there's, I don't know, 250 stills from their upcoming film, Mank. But there's also a kind of a medley of their score playing in the background. And it's it's completely different from anything I've heard them do as, as film composers or anything, because I've I, you know, listened to a ton of Nine Inch Nails, and it's mm -hmm. totally different from anything I've heard him do you know, as that band as well. So, you know, I, I guess they, they have the, the ability to, like, oh, right, we've got our sound, but, you know, let's just do something completely yeah. <laughs> unrelated. I know, but you think, I mean, I think you basically, it's it's more about what people came really, really famous for. So, because even if you think about, think about John Williams back in Johnny mm -hmm. Williams' day, like, you know, if you listen to really early scores, it's pretty jazzy and different for that guy as well. Or like, you know, Catch Me If You Can amazing you know complete it's not what most people associate john williams like massive kind of um sort of uh, orchestral scores for sort of superhero movies and those kinds of things that's a sort of different you know so i think it's it's sort of more it's what there's a, one or two scores that those kinds of individuals have become super super famous for and that's yeah. we assume that's what they do all the time but of course it's quite nice to hear that you know they're doing something very different 
Well, yeah, I was. It's funny you mentioned that. I was listening to. Um, I think the I think the film is Cinderella Liberty. It's you know, I think it's an early '70s or late '60s uh, score or you know, film that John Williams scored, and it's like just super jazzy, and it's a ton of fun yeah. to listen to. And I'm I'm thinking I'm like I've you know I I think it I think it actually won or was nominated for an Academy Award, but wow. I'm like I've never heard anybody talk about this. It's so fun, but yeah, you're right. You know, I would love for you know, John Williams to just say. I'm just going to do a pure jazz score and, and you know it's it's just going to be off the cuff and fun and I'm not going to have you know eight like re- really distinct themes I'm just going to have fun with it uh, yeah. but but yeah you're right and you know every every film that he scores for instance you know it's it's against the kind of the lens of those other well-known scores that he does um, yeah. but I think too kind of on the flip side of you know if you're someone like Philip Glass or, you know, like um, Harold Budd and Robin Guthrie, who, who have kind of this distinct, kind of, you know, minimalist sound as well. Um, it's also going to be limiting the types of films that people want you to work on. You know, no, you know yeah. I don't think many people are going to say, you know, hey, Philip Glass, like, come do this nonstop action film that we have. No, sure. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I would, I would love to hear that. I think that'd be fascinating, <laughs> but I'm, yeah. I'm not holding my breath for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. I know. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, I think it's true. But I, I mean, I like I say, I, th- I, it's sort of, I suppose all of this is a meat point in some ways. You just like, you just do what you do, don't you? And then right. you just try and do the best you can do, and then. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't feel, I'm not really in a position to, I, I, I think I like, I'd like to think that I'm sort of steering my career in various directions, but the reality is that when something comes in, I'm generally like, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just sort of take on various things and then, uh, and then see, see what happens. And, and because, but it was quite, what's been quite nice about Roadkill is because a lot, a lot of the music that I've done for a lot of, a lot of the films I've done over recent years have been fantastic. Uh, sort of British independent films that are largely fairly dark or depressing or sort of worthy true stories or you know I've done an awful lot of that and it's been quite nice to do something that's um, quite distinctly different uh, from that I mean I don't know whether that so I think I've, I've sort of I've, I've in, in, in a way as well been sort of slightly typecast into if you're making a sort of an indie British movie and you don't have a massive budget uh, but uh, you want some interesting score, then I'm sort of one of the people that might be near near the top of your list. Um, but it, I'm hoping that after this and a couple of other things I've done, that I might also be near the top of your list if you want something a bit different from that as well. <laughs> because and for no, not, for none, none, no, no other reason than sometimes it's quite it's quite depressing and dark, dark to be sort of working on something so heavy for so many months. And I feel like often people when they meet me, they're quite surprised. They're like, oh, I thought you'd be like really sort of depressing, <laughs> sort of dark figure. I'm like, you're actually quite a sort of cheery chap. I was like, yeah. I mean, I, I now I just end up doing a lot of these really hard, heavy movies. <laughs> Um, that's I mean you know what though because kind of two of the the films I was most familiar with that you'd worked on were Hard Candy and Shame which yeah. like not at all cheery so you know that was <laughs> that was my expectation too <laughs> yeah not at all cheery that's right well that I mean but they you know it's I think about the you know I think about Shame though I mean Steve McQueen as well he's not like he's not he just I suppose yeah, there doesn't necessarily need to be a, a sort of there doesn't necessarily need to be a connection between the people making things and then the, 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 the sort of darkness of the subject matter. I mean, he's a very ebullient, uh, charismatic, l- lover of life, a joyful character, that guy. I mean, he really is. Um, but he's, he's got a lot to say. Um, but yeah, that's a, quite a dark, that is a, well, a very dark film as well. That is a very dark film. But it's good to, it was a good film to do. Yeah, um, I'm sure it was, you know, it was a, I won't say it was a joy to watch, but it was a very good film to watch. <laughs> Yeah. So, so one one question I had is hitting all these different genres. I mean, and you're you're classically trained. Is there a a genre that you haven't kind of really worked on that much that you want to, or one that you really want to go back to and and work in more? I, I there's well there's a couple of answers to that. I I I am really interested in uh exploring i spent a lot of time doing 
drone tone based things which sounds very boring but i, I think there's an awful lot of uh i find that quite fascinating the sort of textural different varieties that you can get within uh making different tones and noises and how uh that can elicit a massive range of emotions with very very minor changes and things i mean talking about trim resin and Atticus ross they're the masters of that sort of stuff but i've spent a lot of time doing that and messing around with diegetic noise so noise from the mm -hmm. films and then heightening that and turning that into something musical and i've done a lot of that with a filmmaker called clio barnard um who's a fantastic filmmaker in the uk and i just finished a film with her which is, does a bit more of that but then increasingly blending that world in with folk which i did a bit with a song i did a couple of years ago with pj harvey and then a bit very recently with another irish folk singer called um karen casey which i've just done for her this um filmmaker clive barnard's latest film um and I, I i'm very interested in sort of exploring that to going further into sort of folk for drony folkness would be quite interesting so I'd, i'm sort of i'm interested in that and also the other thing i have four children and i would really love to do if anyone out there is interested something that they might be able to watch <laughs> so, so, so i mean i you know i look at i mean obviously he's an absolute genius but i look at all the stuff that michael G giacchino does or any any of the sort of you know sort of um kind of uh, animated movies would be great mm -hmm. fun to do one of those i'd love to do that For the same reason you're just tapping into so many different styles and genres and like it'd be great to do some some of that as more on the nose scoring um i i get the sense it'd be great fun i'm sure it'd be equally really really hard and there'd be teams of people right. Shouting at you all the time, but I think you know at least dealing with dealing with something uh, that's meant to be sort of fun and entertaining for kids might be just quite a fun thing to do for a bit. I bet. I mean, that's I I, I don't know how old your kids are, but that that has to be a little frustrating in some ways for them to to know what you do in an absolute sense, but to maybe not be able to actually experience what you've literally done quite yet. Yeah, it's interesting. That's beginning to become a thing, actually, because the, uh, the eldest, so the young ones are very small. They're only four, but the the, uh, the eldest is 11. And the, then uh, the next one is uh, nine. And they are, so they're kind of aware of what I do, but they can't really watch anything I do because it's all a bit too adult. And that, I think they are finding that annoying. And they can sort of go, they can go on YouTube and they'll hear something and get depressed by another depressing song that daddy's <laughs> done. <laughs> it's like, um, but it would be quite nice to do, you know, <laughs> something a bit more fun they could watch um but anyway that's a it's a very it's a it's a it's a minor thing i'm i can't i really can't complain i'm lucky to do what i'm doing and you know i feel like I, you know every job i do and begin i do feel you know i feel the luckiest person really to be able to do it it's good fun you know yeah um i i actually would appreciate if if uh later on you could email me some of the kind of drone work that you've done because oh, yeah. that's that's i think most people you know n no offense find the genre absolutely boring but yeah, of course. <laughs> but i've i've listened to that for for years when i was younger i i uh i made a little drone it, you know it wasn't very good but i'm i'm a a big fan of the genre so i'd be i'd be really interested to hear what you've what you've done with it yeah well i yeah i've spent a lot of time doing that and i think you're, you're right i mean i often those films, you, you, when when you finish the score, I sort of very proud of them, and they sort of work very well, and everyone's happy. But they, you never release them as a standalone standalone thing. It's like just unbelievably boring to listen to for most people. But there is there is something about. I mean, it, but when when I say that with folk music, because you can, you know, well, we all know with you know sort of having a drone, an Indian sort of you know harmonium drone or any kind of sort of drone, and then people singing a melody against it. It's that. It's a classic thing in any art, isn't it? That there's tension and then home and it was so moving away from the drone more and more distant and then you're coming back and it's that relationship between expanding away from the drone clashing from the drone and then coming back and then being so aware that there's a tonal center or somewhere that's home and then moving away from it warping and how you do that with blending sounds whether they be reed based sounds or string based sounds or organ sounds or you know how or electronic sort of fuzzy sounds or and how those things blend together and how that sometimes creates tension and then you go back there because some of the tones themselves can rather than just tonally it being on a C it might just be that it's a fuzzy guitar sound that sounds like home and then anything that's abrasive and away from that is going away from it and then you come back so all this is essentially it's not it's no different to my mind from you know Beethoven uh, or to the Bach doing you know a, a sort of a prelude you start in a key you know the most famous example you start in C 
And then by the, by the, you know, that obviously that everyone knows, then by the time you get to the middle, you're away, you're away, and when are you going to get, how are you going to get home? And then you finally you get home. It's essentially the same thing with drones and tones, um, but it's just dealing with things more in a more textual um, way. But in with, with folk, what's lovely about that is then you can stick a melody over the top of that and then help hide mm. that. I kind of love the idea of that. But anyway, I will, I'll send you, I mean, it's very nerdy, but I think it's, kind of, I really like it. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I do too. I, you know, no, no one ever listens to me when I talk about, you know, drone, or if I, if I go on about how much I love the, uh, like William Basinski's this, uh, Disintegration Loops, um, you know, I, I listen to that all the time. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, unfortunately, there's not a big audience for like, <laughs> five hour compositions that sound like the same thing the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, I, I, like I said, I love it, but I don't blame people who don't. You should get. You should do. You should do because. But, but film film composing is. There's a lot, as you know. There's a lot of that in film composing. It's, so it's quite a nice. It's quite a nice job for people who are into that because you know. But, you, but that's a lot of the time what you're asked to do. Yeah, well, and and I, you know, circling back a little bit, it it is something that's kind of so common because it, you know, as you mentioned, there's the functional aspect, but yeah. people are kind of so used to and kind of um, married to the idea of that like a Wagnerian leitmotif and expecting these these really distinct thematic elements and and thematic not in solely just the sound sense but in in a distinct melody and yeah. and I totally understand why people like that you know I like it too but it's not it's not what all film music is and it's not really what it all should be. It's, it's appropriate in certain things and, and you know, not appropriate in others. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think as the, as the genre kind of continues to expand and as more composers and musicians who, you know, aren't used to film music or, or aren't trained in doing that in the first place, get involved in the genre, it, you know, the the sounds continue to change and get broader and so I'm hoping that as that happens people's minds open a little bit and you know, become fans of all the various genres that and, and styles that are used yeah I, I do I really I, I strongly agree with that actually I think it's um you know when I do sort of um occasionally do sort of film music talks to people at conservatoire or um universities that they in people studying film music it, it's it is you know, I'm often, I often mention it's really in terms of in, in the cultural context of something that you're, we're studying, you know, from musicians when you're studying, you know, you're studying music from hundreds of years ago. And this is a really, really, really new art form in the, yeah. in the sort of evolution of music um, and the music that we're using. And it's uh, we are really, really still finding our feet. It's not that long ago. And I think a lot of these sort of the, the a lot of these ideas and prejudices come um because of that, uh, because of the because the the of the use of it really. So I think there has in in certain circles some people are sort of snobby about light motifs because they think it's uh, a little bit uh, obvious, and some people think that you know because it wasn't that far, it wasn't that long ago when we were sort of doing silent movies and early sort of talkies where you'd have a, a picture of a woman with her hands shaking in front of her face and you'd have a diminished chord, you know. The, or that kind of whatever it might be you know in the piano and, it, and then that's sort of seen as unsophisticated and therefore if we're doing the same thing now but you're right it's sort of courses for courses it's, or if you're doing just a droney thing like the thing we were talking about there's still a massive amount of work goes into those things yeah. and creative thought and but it, and, and there's room for all of these things and you're absolutely right it's, it's it's about sort of it's about it being functional it's about it being apposite or appropriate or germane for the particular um this particular drama uh, uh, that, that you're dealing with, with a particular set of kind of characters or emotions you're dealing with. And it's not, uh, I mean, I think that's what makes, for me, that's what makes it absolutely a fascinating job. Is because I, don't, I, I think you'd be, you, I think you'd be hard pushed to find anyone who does my job, who uh, is particularly snobby about, because uh, I think you sort of, even if you only really do one particular thing or you come at it from a, being in a band or whatever, I think you're just doing it a little bit, you realize that there's just, so much depth in in everything that anyone's doing at any level in any genre on this stuff that it's it's just uh 
it's quite mind blowing really. And it's, you know, and I think that's what's fascinating about it. It's also kind of a bit unknown. I, no, I don't think any, well, I certainly feel like I don't really know what I'm doing ever. Uh, and you're just, it's sort of alchemy really. You're just trying these things out and you, you know, like the Hugh, the Hugh Laurie thing, you, well, he's a bit mischievous and I'll try some chromatic thing. I'll try messing around. And you sort of have some ideas of what might work, but you get, I mean, I probably, I don't know, I must've done 30 or 40 different little ditties before that one kind of like mm. finally was the one. And, just trial and error really and then and then you and then it's thankfully it's corroborated by other people so they go yes i think that's sick. and then you don't feel so much blame or ownership of it because well he said it was all right so <laughs> well, and, and and when the director says like oh yeah that works you go all right well that's if, the, if the director good. likes it then i'm safe yeah <laughs> that's right yeah um so i you know i wish we could talk for you know three more hours but uh might be a little too much. I don't think people want to hear us talk for that long. Um, no. I did have I did have uh, one more question though that I wanted to ask you. And you're yeah. talking about planning on releasing the the score itself pretty soon, and I know that you actually have a surprising amount of scores that you've released that have dialogue samples from the film um, interlaced within, and it I, I actually kind of like that because it, I think it helps shape the narrative of of the the score that you've released that it's not simply a piece of music but it, it also has its own arc um you know is that is that something that you're considering for roadkill and when do you decide whether to do that or not well at this stage where <clears throat> at the stage where i'm doing the uh it's really it's because i've you know, some of the soundtracks I loved listening to when I was growing up had that in it. And I sort of thought that that's really nice. It's sort of, um, it takes you into that same zone and makes you realize what it's for. And I, and I do, I don't think it's a, some, some musicians sort of see it as a lesser thing because of that, but I think it is, it is functional music. It is married to something. Um, and it, it comes from that and is it's whole existence and reason for being is because of the drama, because of the story. So I think sometimes it's a really lovely thing if you can, have it actually linked with that sound all with one thing because it's, it's like that sort of Cohen brothers and sort of Skip Luce and uh, Carter Bowell kind of combination of those, you know, the sound, they're all, they, they all think about these things together, you know, and I think I, I try and do it. I know lots of people do my job to do as well. I think, think of these things together. So I, I really think quite carefully about all of the sound when I'm doing the music or whether they might marry together. So I do quite like the idea of uh, doing that where it's appropriate. I think, um, Often I do it when there are scenes which I think are really fantastic uh, yeah. and the music might be um, really interesting and you might be really interested in it because it's a bit drone based or tonal. Um, but actually, it's, and it's part of the score and it's, it's an essential part of the score, but actually on its own, it might be a bit meaningless for a lot of people. So then I kind of put dialogue in those scenes because then it sort of makes you feel, oh yeah, I remember that bit. Oh yeah, I know. So there's a sort of, it's a, like it's a little jog of a memory to re relive and re enjoy the film. But my, my rule of thumb for soundtracks is you know, if, you, if you're not necessarily that interested in, uh, if you're not that sort of geeky or really into, into, into soundtracks, is this an interesting, is this a standalone piece of music that you'd be thinking, yeah, that's kind of a nice mm. thing to listen to, or it's interesting, or it's diverting, or there's something about it. And I think that's my rule of thumb. And um, so I think there's a very sort of long-winded answer. I think for, for Roadkill, I have prepared the soundtrack. And in that instance, we haven't used any of the dialogue from Roadkill. Um, and there are, there's a couple of reasons why we didn't decide to in that one. But I think I mean, the simplest answer is there's a lot of quite nice melodic music that's just quite nice music, yeah. really. So we just thought, well, let's put it out there as, 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 as music. When you basically, when you do put the text in, when you put, it creates more lawyery problems. And you know what I mean? You suddenly have to, everyone has to approve it. And then the music people don't like it because they're not going to be able to sync your music to something else because it's got dialogue all over it. And I don't care about that stuff, but they of course you want to try and make some money. And then the writers have to approve it. And in that context, if you kind of change the, you often have, you often want to sort of space things out a bit more and then you're not allowed to do that. And then, so it get, it does can get, I mean, I basically, I'm really happy that you like those moments in the soundtracks because I have basically, when they're in there, I really want them to be in there because you have to fight a bit harder to get those things in there. But I think it makes it more enjoyable for the listener. I'm basically, if I put a soundtrack out, the only reason I'll do it is because I think, I hope this is going to be worthwhile and interesting for people to listen to. It's, it's, I know it sounds really obvious, but I think a lot of people, when I mean, I've done an awful lot of things, and I've only got you know, seven or eight things up there because I think they're, you know, and there's a lot of other things that I'm very proud of, but they just don't work on their own. Makes sense. And, and yeah, I think at the end of the day, as, as a listener, that's obviously the preferable thing. Um, 
you know, if you've if you've done sixty things, you know, some people are completionists and and want to hear every single thing that you've done. But the this this is going to sound really obvious, but you're not composing the music to be listened to on its own. It's right. it's first and foremost in the context of the film or the show or the scene, and if it works on its own, you know, that's that's great. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That's exactly where I see it. That is exactly right. But happily for Roadkill, ge genuinely happy for Roadkill, there's just some nice... I mean, I had, I've had loads of people. And I don't, I'm not on Twitter, really. I mean, I'm on it, but then I, don't, I look at it occasionally and then, like, once every few months, I go, oh, I really should say something. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm terrible. But like a dinosaur. But, the, <laughs> the, but I've, yeah, it, I was watching it on whenever it was last Sunday night on BBC over here. With, it, just when it went out, so I thought it'd be fun. Sat down with my wife and we watched it. There's loads of people like talking about the music, saying they really liked it. Is it you can release the like the, the dots, you know, the music, the piano pieces? You can release them. So we, we've done a little thing on Faber, and some some people kind of got in touch saying, oh, "I can't doubt because maybe the different generation they can't they don't know how to download mm -hmm. it." So I've like had to print out loads of scores and send them to people, and it's been fun, you know. Like I really like that. It's kind of like people because they are in this particular instance they are sort of happily just, but as you say, because it's happened to serve the, serve the 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 the, 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 um, the drama. They are basically nice little standalone tunes, basically they're in, in their own right, which is kind of cool. You know? But it's 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 uh, it's just that's been a lucky coincidence, really, more than anything yeah. else. Well, I don't know. That's that's cool. I'm looking forward to when it releases in the U.S. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think with uh, you know location tracking and all that, I can't use my my wife's family's login <laughs> for the the U.K. players. <laughs> so I've, I've got to sure, wait a little longer. I'm sure there'll be a way of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Harry, I I really appreciate it. Um, it was it was great chatting with you. Well, it's lovely. Yeah, it's lovely to chat to you as well. And uh, yeah, thanks thanks for, thanks very much for talking to me about it. it oh yeah, fun. of course. It was it was a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your drone music as well. I'll send it over. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, you have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, cheers. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Take Bye. care.